Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar today. Um, we're going to give people a few more minutes to trickle in. Um, but yeah, go ahead and sit tight. Hi everyone, good morning or good afternoon or good evening wherever you're viewing from. Uh, my name's Marina, I'm gonna be helping to narrate the webinar today. Um, today our webinar is called Rheology of Food Products and it will be presented by Dr. Christian Ochoa. Uh, Dr. Christian Ochoa is an application scientist with RioSense Inc. He has extensive experience with viscometry as well as optical microscopy, uh, high-speed digital imaging and x-ray scattering techniques. Uh, he gained all these techniques during his time of University of Illinois at Chicago. Um, and without further ado, I will let him start his presentation. Thank you very much, Marina, for the wonderful introduction. Hello, everybody. Um, <clears throat> so we're gonna talk about food products today. Uh, food products are pretty much all around us in our daily lives. <clears throat> so. It's actually known that the US packaged food market size is valued at around a trillion dollars um, in 2021. And that's uh, actually expected to grow pretty well at about 5% um, every year for the next uh, eight years or so. So in this talk, we're gonna focus on studying the, um, we're gonna study the viscosity of food products, like the ones shown here. And these products are widely consumed uh, worldwide. So the first of these products is guar gum. So this is a polysaccharide that it's often used as a thickener, uh, emulsifier, and stabilizer, like shelf stabilizer of food products. So these products can be ice cream, uh, salad dressing, and these uh, delicious sauces. I think this one is barbecue. So we're also gonna characterize a protein that's derived from casein. I don't know how many of you are uh, familiar with casein. Uh, this is a the most common protein that's found in milk. And even small amounts of this, um, um, <clears throat> amounts of this protein will um, give uh, the milk its cloudy appearance. So we're gonna look at a protein that's derived from casein. Uh, this is called sodium casinate. And that protein is more water soluble and this is used to foam, um, thicken and emulsify a bunch of fruit products. So these products are like these baked goods. Uh, it includes uh, coffee creamers that can be added to cheeses um, or whipped topping like the one shown here on this uh, looks like a peach cobbler. <clears throat> so we focus on, on emulsions as well so those are shown here on the bottom and emulsions are actually a mixture of two liquids that don't really like each other so they normally are going to be immiscible um, without like an added emulsifier so in the case of mayonnaise hopefully all of you like mayonnaise uh, so this is an oil and water emulsion um, so this is uh, 
oil droplets stabilized by the addition of a emulsifier. So in mayonnaise case, that would be um, eggs. Or if you have a um, like a vegan variety or maybe a low fat variety, that would be addition of polysaccharides that would uh, help with the uh, stabilization of these. And then you have milk and yogurt, which contain uh, fat droplets that are stabilized by the milk proteins. So using these studies, we can improve our understanding of the rheology uh, and viscosity of these fruit products. And this is gonna help with improving um, like the, their mouthfeel, uh, texture, um, and stability as well. And then another impact that doesn't have to, that doesn't relate to how you're exactly to how you're eating it is with optimization of uh, food processing and um, like packaging applications. So that's another application. So these are the topics we want to cover today in our talk. We want to start with first introducing the VROC technology. So viscometer, rheometer on a chip. And this is what we're going to be using to measure the viscosity of the food products. Now we're going to study uh, the food additive called guar gum, as I introduced already. So an interesting thing about guar gum is that it can be degraded uh, partially. Um, so its molecular weight will drop. And this will happen under acidic or high temperature conditions. So this degradation is gonna, it's gonna negatively impact its thickening power and also like its emulsifying and stabilizing properties. And we can actually monitor this uh, degradation by measuring the, the corresponding viscosity drop with time. So the viscosity is gonna drop while this degrades. So this process though can take multiple hours to occur. So up to nine hours we saw here. So it can be studied very well with the initium that we have uh, out in the field and in-house, as well as our new MVROC2 instrument. So this is gonna be relevant for preparation of high temperature acidic food products that contain guar gum. Um, for the next part, we're going to perform a full intrinsic viscosity analysis. So I think uh, some of you are, have shown interest in performing uh, this kind of analysis. In this talk, we're gonna show both single point intrinsic viscosity analysis, as well as full intrinsic viscosity analysis. And we're gonna do this on this sodium cassinate protein derived from milk. Um, and actually, um, so it's derived from casein in milk, and actually casein is more common in milk than even whey protein, which maybe some of you take before going to the gym. So we're going to show how combining uh, intrinsic viscosity with micelle uh, molecular weight uh, can give us an estimate of the, this aggregate, this micelle hydrodynamic radius and volume fraction. So these micelles um, will form in these solutions and Later in the talk, I will explain how they're um, how they form in the solution, how they're relevant, and how can they can affect the like the the end product. So, like guar gum, uh, sodium cassinate is also used as an emulsifier. So, using viscosity uh, to study uh, like the micellar properties is going to help us understand. Uh, also, what role the micelles play in these uh, emulsions, um, food product emulsions, and also other food products. In the last section, we're going to look at emulsions. So we perform uh, viscosity uh, shear and extensional measurements with different types of mayonnaise, and also with uh, milk and yogurt dairy products. So here we're going to showcase the use of our newly released uh, MVROC2 viscometer. And these results are gonna help us with formulating, um, this can help with formulating new uh, mayo varieties um, that have like a good mouthfeel, better texture. And of course, like I mentioned before, with optimizing uh, your food processing and packaging of these uh, foods. So let's get into the, how our technology, the core of our technology works. For those who are not uh, too familiar, 
<clears throat> so first I start with, start with a short review on uh, viscosity. So this is the resistance of a fluid to flowing. So for example, a high viscosity fluid, uh, so like honey with respect to water, this will have a higher resistance to flow than a, the lower visc uh, viscous fluid. So you can define the viscosity as shear stress that's experienced uh, <clears throat> by a fluid. Uh, the shear stress is experienced by the fluid divided by the shear rate. So, <clears throat> um, or the rate of deformation. So in this diagram, you can see how the shear rate is the velocity um, gradient that's perpendicular to the direction of flow, which is this way. So another way to think of these shear flows is to think of them as these uh, adjacent fluid elements, like adjacent sheets, that are moving past each other at different velocities. So at the nano and microscopic level, the viscosity can be thought of as the molecular friction between molecules or your particles or other self-assembled structures. So viscosity can be sensitive to what's going to be happening at this level, and it's going to inform you on the like the nano and um, microstructure of uh, these elements. So now we move on to explaining uh, how our VROC technology can be used to measure viscosity. So VROC uh, stands for, as I mentioned before, viscometer, rheometer on a chip. This is different than rotational instruments and other gravity uh, and gravity capillary, um, gravity uh, driven capillary tubes. So this uh, technology combines microfluidics, the microfluidic channel and MEMS or microelectromechanical systems, these four uh, sensors in the channel. So you're gonna have this rectangular microfluidic channel with the four sensors aligned along the length of the channel. And we can control the flow rates through the channel uh, and see the response or the monitor the linear pressure drop along these four uh, sensors. So for the fixed flow rates and fixed uh, channel dimensions you have, you can calculate here the shear rate from the slope of the pressure drops. So this slope that would be here uh, <clears throat> and the channel dimensions, you can calculate the shear stress. So combining um, these two, you input them here, and you get your viscosity. So this is how the core of our technology is going to work. <clears throat> so let's move on to one thing I would quickly like to mention. So this would be um, the different chip types. So I'm going to be going over the multiple chip types on, the, um, um, on our instruments. And this is something that I'll be referring to here and there as I uh, show the data that we got. Um, so one quick thing is that <clears throat> you have a microfluidic channel, the one I showed in the previous slide. Each microfluidic channel is housed in a chip like this. So maybe most of you, um, especially if you use uh, the VROC viscometers, you're familiar with uh, um, how these chips um, work or the difference between different chip types. So these different chip types are going to vary depending on the mainly two things, the channel depth. So that's uh, number is shown here in the serial number and the max pressure of the four that the four MEM sensors can handle. So you can get that um, information from the serial number. So that's going to show the the chip type, so this is a BO5, the max pressure corresponds to a B chip max pressure, so that would be max pressure of 42 for a B chip. And then for this O5 stands for a 50 micron depth channel, so that would be um, like as shown here in the table. So the higher the letter, so if you go from A to B to C and so on, you're gonna have um, a higher max pressure as well as a higher uh, max viscosity. Um, so these are four of the 50 micron depth chips we have for our um, MVROC2 viscometer. 
So this is the max flow rate you can get with the uh, Ampere tube viscometer with the 2x pump. And this is actually the highest flow rate that you can get with uh, all the viscometers we've released. Uh, we do have other channel depths available for the Enviroc 2, and these are going to help you study a wider range um, of shear rates and viscosities. Another nice thing about the Enviroc 2 is that you can do sample retrieval, um, just like for the uh, initium uh, units. So this is going to allow you to get many, many measurements without having to touch the syringe, like without having to reload it. So with that info in mind, Let's get to the nice data that we collected. So <clears throat> here uh, we explored the thermal degradation of gorgon uh, acidic solutions with viscosity measurements. So we measured the viscosity of these solutions with varying pH and temperature over time. And this is uh, to understand how this pH and temperature changes will affect the degradation process. So we use the Initium 1 Plus uh, to study the degradation. Uh, and to get uh, for the solution preparation, we mixed the guar gum uh, with DI water, heated the mixture to 80 degrees for like two to three hours. Uh, and this allowed us to get the guar gum into solution very well. So after that, we allowed it to rest at room temperature. Then we filtered with the um, um, a small size pore filter just to remove any fibers or large particles that could clog the channel. And then to that solution, we added a small amount, tiny amount of HCl, hydrochloric acid, to drop their pH. So like one to two um, values. So this didn't really change the concentration of the, of the solutions. So we first uh, prepared a 0.5 weight percent solution. Um, and <clears throat> to check, um, you know, like uh, which pH values and temperatures would lead to this uh, significant degradation. So for those measurements, we used the BO5 chip. Uh, we performed a single <clears throat> point um, intrinsic analysis to calculate the, the molecular weight over time as well. So this would uh, show us the degradation. So for those measurements, um, the single point intrinsic viscosity ones, we used uh, a different solution. So we had to use a dilute solution for those. So for that one, we used a 0.07 weight percent gorgon. And for that one, we used the BO35 chip on the initium. So this is a uh, chip that is available, and this can give you the best data you can get for intrinsic viscosity analysis if your sample is like below one and a half center point. Uh, so for all samples, around 63 to 68 microliters were loaded, and we used the sample retrieval function so that all of our trial segments uh, were performed with um, just one volume, so you didn't have to touch the unit at all. This would run all the steps for you. And yeah, so pretty much when performing, uh, running these samples, the question we had is how do lower and higher, lower pH and higher temperatures how are they going to influence the guar gum, um, guar gum degradation? So here is the data of uh, viscosity versus time of these acidic guar gum solutions, 0.5 weight percent. So on the y-axis is actually the viscosity at any point divided by the initial viscosity at time zero. So it gives us this term called, that we call the relative apparent viscosity. The x-axis is the time it uh, is like how much time these samples were exposed to these elevated temperatures of 50 to 70 degrees um, with um, for these multiple pH uh, so 1.5 and 2 pH solutions. So there's about a hundred measurements here for each uh, experiment. So that's about <clears throat> that took about three hours in total to take. If you want, we can provide you with this exact measurement protocol so that you can study degradation of your own um, proteins, enzymes, polysaccharides um, at your elevated temperatures. So you can see here uh, the thermal degradation of these solutions occurring over multiple hours, so about three hours. So we can see that 
we monitored it by looking at this corresponding drop in viscosity. So you can see here with the, P, the solution with pH of two, with the 50 degrees, viscosity only drops about 10%, not much, uh, still enough uh, to not be you know, considered background. But if you look at this one, this is the 1.5 pH in 70 degrees. This one drops by 80%. That's a significant, significant jump. So we can see that this enhanced viscosity uh, drop, or you could say enhanced degradation, as you uh, drop the pH and increase the temperature, and this is gonna be more noticeable for temperatures above 50 degrees. Uh, there have been studies before conducted by researchers that show similar trends, but however, um, their methods only show a max of 11 viscosity measurements, uh, whereas we take hundreds, can easily take hundreds with the Initium. And this is, of course, thanks to Initium, and now Ambirac 2 can, can do this as well. So here we have, we took different samples, and we did similar studies, like elevated the temperature, see like how it degraded over time. But this time, instead of measuring at this elevated temperature, we measured at 25. So we cranked up the temperature, let it degrade, cranked it down, measure at 25. So you may be asking, why did we want to measure at 25? Well, that's for the purposes of um, the single point um, intrinsic viscosity analysis that we wanted to perform on this data. And that's for the purpose of getting a molecular weight. So we want to see how the molecular weight drops as the solutions are degrading. So, <clears throat> so we can see here that um, there's about six, uh, 40 points, and each of those is an average of about 15 uh, data points. Uh, so about 600 segments were taken here. Uh, so these samples were allowed to run overnight, uninterrupted. And then another thing I'd like to point out is that the error bars are pretty small for pretty much all the samples here. And this is showing how reproducible the data on the initium is for these like low viscosity samples. So <clears throat> as you can imagine, these measurements took about many hours. It was about nine hours, each of these. But to me, I felt, you know, quick because I went to sleep and came back and, you know, it was not, I felt like a very, very short. <laughs> so we took the, the measurements at 25. And if you want this exact same measurement protocol, again, we'll be happy to give that to you so you can measure the degradation of your own um, chemicals. So here we have, uh, so basically this is showing how 50 degrees, it degrades, 70 degrees, it's degrading uh, even more. So it's about uh, double the degradation of 50 degrees. So it's showing how elevating the temperature is gonna give you more degradation. So now let's get the molecular weight. Let's see how the molecular weight changes as you as you increase the temperature for this acidic guargam solution. So here we plotted the molecular weight, reciprocal molecular weight versus time. So you're probably wondering why reciprocal? Why didn't you just plot the molecular weight versus time? So the purposes of that is to, for, for uh, some analysis we uh, will talk about soon. So that was to determine the kinetics of uh, this degradation. So stepping back, how do we get the molecular weight? We used um, the solomon pseudo equation to calculate intrinsic viscosity. So this intrinsic viscosity, for this we only need one concentration, which is 0.07, that's inputted here. This here is the relative viscosity, so the viscosity of your, during any time of your measurement divided by the solvent viscosity. Um, so if you want the derivation for this expression, again, let us know. We can send you the app note with that derivation, and I'm sure you can find it uh, other places as well. So to get the molecular weight, we use the Mark-Huwink equation. 
So this equation relies on two parameters, kappa and alpha. <clears throat> and these are going to depend on the polymer solvent system. So the parameter A uh, indicates the solvent quality. So if you have A is, for example, 0.5, that would be more appropriate for like a theta solvent. A greater than, greater than 0.5 would be more for like a good solvent. <clears throat> so in our calculations, we use these values for kappa and A. And <clears throat> these are values we got from the literature that apply to 25 degrees only. So that's why we measured these samples at 25. So we elevated the temperature, degraded the heck out of them, dropped the temperature, measured at 25, and so on, repeated, so on and so on until we finished the measurements. So we can see here for both samples, the uh, inverse molecular weight increases with, um, with uh, the time at elevated temperature. And we can see here that for the sample at the higher elevated temperature, you have this increased uh, degradation. So this uh, line has a much higher slope, which means uh, the molecular weight was dropping a lot more. And it's in showing this uh, how much more it's degrading. Um, so <clears throat> we can see that this relationship can be fit with a linear fit. And this uh, is going to is suggesting that the degradation is following uh, this first order uh, kinetics as mentioned in the literature as well. So the degradation is um, random with respect to like the chain cleavage. So the rate of reaction is not depending on the, so the rate of reaction depends only on the concentration of the undergraded polymer chains. So here we showed uh, how we conducted single point intrinsic viscosity analysis. So at one concentration. In the next section, we perform a full intrinsic viscosity analysis. And this one is done with sodium cassinate. So sodium cassinate is this uh, amphiphilic protein uh, that is very water soluble, more so than casein. And this is going to assemble into these um, aggregates or micelles in solution. So you can actually learn more about uh, sodium cassinate uh, from our previous uh, app notes, uh, blogs, and even a webinar we've made before. Uh, it's called Monitoring Self-Assembly in Complex Fluids with Viscosity. Uh, you can find that in our YouTube channel. So this intrinsic viscosity analysis on these micelles uh, this in, <clears throat> is important because it's going to help us understand the micelle parameters. So one of those is hydrodynamic radius, another is volume fraction, and these affect the rheological properties of the solutions they are in. So to perform this analysis, we have to measure the viscosity for multiple dilute concentrations, which we prefer uh, made by mixing this uh, powder with DI water. Uh, well, DI water not shown here, but so we left that to um, stir overnight, uh, and then we centrifuged um, and um, removed the supernatant and then filtered the solutions to remove any large uh, particles. So for the measurements, uh, we use the intrinsic measurement protocols, so intrinsic viscosity measurement that are included with uh, Initium software uh, and should be included with uh, future uh, uh, I think should be included with the future, uh, with the release of the NVROC2. <clears throat> so this is because we use this protocol because this is gonna target the highest rate possible to give you good quality data you need for this analysis. So keep in mind that if you're using this intrinsic viscosity protocol with the BO35 chip, uh, which is what we used, you want your sample to be under 1.5 centipoy. If you use the BO5 chip, which is the most common one, you can go up to like four and a half centipoy. Uh, also make sure you select a 90 microliter loading protocol for those of you who are um, more interested in how exactly you should load into the initium. Um, and make sure you load 90 microliters into your water vial that will go on the rack. Never load more than 150 microliters into each of these water vials. Uh, because this can drop your loading efficiency, and uh, that's not optimized, optimal. Also, we recommend that you use a positive displacement pipette 
instead of an air displacement pipette. Um, but if you were to use an air displacement pipette, you can do load about 20 to 30 percent more sample. Uh, the software should give you a loaded volume between 63 to 68. Uh, that, that range is good. If it's lower than this, if it's telling you it's lower, just make sure to check the use counts on your the auto sampler syringe, um, the calibration positions. Um, it's very important also that you use a micro centrifuge for these water vials with the sample already in them. Uh, and this is crucial so that you avoid having any bubbles in your loaded sample. And for those of you who use the Initium already, if you have bubbles or bad loading, it can give you these minus one uh, viscosity codes and lower repeatability. Okay, um, so that's some um, tips uh, that I wanted to mention. So moving on to sample, moving on from the sample preparation. So we're gonna continue demonstrating how we perform the analysis. Uh, so that's uh, the first question here. How can we use the intrinsic viscosity to calculate uh, the micelle hydrodynamic radius and volume fraction? And uh, by uh, performing this analysis from this question. So here we have data we got with the Initium 1 Plus of uh, viscosity versus sodium calcinate concentration. These data points actually have error bars, which are smaller than symbols here. You can see from the fit that the viscosity is increasing quadratically with concentration. What this means is that we can perform uh, intrinsic viscosity analysis with these concentrations, so this is good. And this is because the theoretical model equations that we use are gonna apply to this range. So talking about these model equations, um, previous uh, group, um, uh, one of the researchers called Marianne Roulette, uh, probably butchering the name, they used a model equation called a bachelor equation, and they modeled the viscosity of these uh, micelles with respect to volume fraction using that equation. Uh, for this equation to hold, you need to assume, uh, have assumptions like uh, one of the main one is uh, assume that these are hard spheres, and this is assumption will apply for these dilute dilute solutions. So, <clears throat> moving on to the intrinsic viscosity, uh, full intrinsic viscosity analysis, we use this Huggins and Kramer equations to perform the analysis. Um, so these equations rely on reduced and inherent viscosities that are plotted here with respect to concentration of sodium calcinate. So we can see here that uh, these equations are defined here. Uh, this uh, reduced is the relative minus one divided by concentration. Inherent is the natural log of your relative viscosity divided by concentration. These, um, so plotting these points here, you can see that there's a linear relationship between the, these viscosities and concentration. And by looking, just looking at the equations here, if you disregard this term, you can see this is a linear uh, equation, and you can see that the y-intercept is the intrinsic viscosity. So intrinsic viscosity is gonna tell you like information about the intramolecular interactions, or like the structure of these proteins. Uh, for example, how well like the mo water molecules can get in or hydrate the sodium calcinate proteins. Now for the slope here, this will give you the Huggins and Kramer, so K-H-K-K, -K -K, uh, <clears throat> the, these constants, and this will inform you on interactions between these neighboring micelles, neighboring particles. So if we take the linear fits of uh, these rescaled viscosities, we extrapolate to zero concentration or the y-intercept. As you know, you get the intrinsic viscosity and that's around 0 0.2 to 0 0.21. So these are units are inverse of concentration. Uh, the values in the literature are about 0.15 to 1.17. That depends on which source you're looking at. And this may be due to differences in like the batches they're using versus ours. Um, so if you take BSA, intrinsic viscosity, and water, 
that one is about three times lower, about 0 0.08 instead of 0 0.21. So just like a quick comparison between those. So we use the intrinsic viscosity values we got along with this reported molecular weight from this source to calculate the hydrodynamic radius and the, of this micelle. So this is the radius of this uh, hydrated micelle. Uh, again, if you want this derivation of this equation, we can send you an app note with that info. So we ended up getting around 11 to 12 nanometers for the radius. And this agrees uh, with the literature. Um, so if we compare this now to like a radius of a BSA, bovine serum albumin aggregate. The BSA one is about less than half of this one. That one is about 4.4. Now, using this, we calculate the micelle volume fraction. It's essentially the micelle number density times the hydrodynamic volume. So this is the micelle number density's concentration times Avogadro's number divided by my molecular weight. The hydrodynamic volume is the volume of a sphere with the radius equal to the hydrodynamic radius. And we get this here, that the volume fraction is this number times the concentration for these dilute concentrations. Uh, and we end up getting 0.04 to 0.14 as a volume fraction. So that is the result for that. And next we move on to, uh, we focus on these protein stabilized emulsions. So we start uh, with mayonnaise. Um, I don't know why I sounded excited there, but uh, I seem to like mayonnaise a lot. <laughs> so we begin with studying the shear and extensional, extensional viscosity of these mayonnaise products shown here. Um, so real mayonnaise, full fat, light mayonnaise, and this vegan spread. So I cannot call it mayonnaise, but maybe you'll hear me call it mayonnaise here and there. Um, so mayonnaise is basically an oil and like vinegar, lemon juice emulsion, oil and water emulsion. Uh, so you can see an example here in the schematic of um, this is like a mixture of this protein uh, stabilized oil droplets and these unabsorbed proteins. So these droplets have been considered in the literature as colloidal particles with some amount of softness. Uh, if you have vegan mayo, um, the egg protein is gonna be replaced with uh, non-animal protein or uh, viscosity like enhancer like a uh, food starch. If you have uh, low fat mayo, uh, mayonnaise, some of the fat will be replaced with like food, uh, food starch again. And this is to maintain that viscosity such that your mayo is not like disgusting. <laughs> uh, so, and this is like a, an issue in formulating these uh, lower fat and um, vegan varieties that people are actively, actively trying to solve. Um, this food starch actually can be guar gum. So that's like one of the food starches. And that's what we looked at before at guar gum uh, um, data here in this presentation. So yeah, you want to uh, have these uh, low-fat vegan that are emulating the like the rheology texture stability of this uh, of like the full-fat mayonnaise. So this can be tackled if by using uh, uh, appropriate viscosity measurements, which themselves can be very challenged because mayo is uh, thixotropic and yield stress. And this is gonna make it harder to get these reproducible steady state measurements. So let's talk about what we did uh, for the experiments. We took the mayo, backloaded it into the MVROC syringe. So for the MVROC, uh, then we tapped the syringe multiple times to get any air pockets to go to the back end. Uh, we then performed uh, shear rates and extensional rate sweeps from high to low shear rates. And for the shear ones, we used a B20 and E20 chips. For extensional, we used a C20 chip. So all on the Ambiroc one. So this was done back in uh, uh, December. So from experiments in literature that we looked at, the droplet size of oil in the mayo is expected to be uh, less than 20 microns. 
And that depends on which brand of mayo you buy. If it's like a more of a generic brand of mayo, it might have like larger droplets than that. Um, so this is good that these droplets are this small because if they're much larger, like less greater than 10% of the depth of this, uh, uh, so this is a 200 micron depth channel, uh, it could give us lower quality data. So <clears throat> to address the, now to address the thixotropic and yield stress of the mayonnaise, we let the chip sensors relax for a minimum of five minutes prior to all the measurements. So then uh, for cleaning, with the help of, uh, of my team here, including Marina Jaget, who introduced me today, we cleaned the chip uh, with uh, undiluted aquats, so full strength aquat, thick aquat, followed by IPA, IPA. And then the syringe, we cleaned that with uh, aquat and then IPA. Uh, so for these uh, appropriate protocols now, we're gonna continue answering this question, how are we gonna use VROC to study the shear and extension of viscosity of full fat, light, and vegan uh, mayo or vegan spread. So here we show data of viscosity versus shear rate for mayonnaise, the three mayonnaise samples. So we can see that all of these have this power law drop in viscosity, about two orders of magnitude over four orders of mag um, and shear rate. So this behavior has been extensively shown in the literature, um, but this data presented problems due to um, this yield stress and uh, thixotropic behavior of mayo. So for example, at these lower shear rates, there's a deviation in this power law behavior and this uh, may be due to slippage in, in the channel that we, in our microfluidic channel. So at the walls of the channel, slippage. And this is indicating that this uh, behavior here at the lowest rates may not actually reflect the real viscosity of the sample. So if we have slippage, the assumptions that we use of no slip boundary condition, they're not gonna hold. Um, so in the future, one of you or somebody can potentially confirm this slip, slippage by um, comparing the viscosity between different chip channel depths. So if one gets like different results between the different depths, it can uh, indicate the slippage you're gonna get. So moving on. So this is extensional viscosity now versus extensional rates. So now we're into the meat of this extension of viscosity uh, measurements in the talk. So here the viscosity is spanning two orders of magnitude, uh, about three orders of mag in the viscosity range. For rates about greater than 100, you can see this power law drop. Uh, for rates less than 10, you can see this funny thing happening. So it's kind of plateauing for the light uh, and vegan mayo samples where it's, it continues up for the full fat one. Uh, but these error bars are pretty large. And again, this may be due to slippage at these walls um, of the channel. That's like artificially dropping your viscosity and giving you this poor reproducibility. And this is like what we saw right before for the shear viscosity. So yeah, to conclude this section, um, these methods and data in these past few slides that can be used to formulate new varieties uh, with like the similar uh, like texture, rheology to like the full fat mayo that many people uh, really enjoy uh, eating. So the last part, so I have uh, 14 minutes here. Um, this is gonna be about two additional systems. Uh, this is whole milk and whole milk yogurt. Uh, so these products, uh, measuring the viscosity, this is going to help with designing more optimal uh, processing methods. Uh, also going to can help for improving quality control and for making these products, uh, modifying uh, like new products that the consumer will like more. So for these tests, we got milk and the yogurt from our local store. So we made sure they were both plain, no flavor. We don't want any like 
unnecessary particles in there that would um, um, <clears throat> clog up the channel. And we were not going to eat these samples, so <laughs> no need for any flavors to be added. So these products also do not have any added thickeners that could raise, uh, these thickeners could raise the viscosity and they could also contribute to shear thinning. Um, so none of that was added. So we focus on temperatures five and 25 degrees. And this is uh, mainly because uh, this is within the temperature range at which these uh, products are usually handled. Uh, for the milk, we use the MVROC2, the new MVROC2. Uh, equipped with the BO5 chip, 2.5 mil syringe. So this syringe allows you to get to these uh, super high shear rates. For the yogurt sample, we uh, went with the C20 chip, which is available with the uh, uh, MBROC1. And for that, we used the 10 milliliter, um, 10 milliliter syringe. Um, so, <clears throat> For the fat droplets here and for milk, it's a, they're about one to two microns, so they shouldn't affect the quality of our data. Um, on the other hand, yogurt has a couple issues, not as much as mayo, but one of the issues that it, is that it can have um, inhomogeneities within the may, uh, yogurt that can, um, if you introduce into the channel, this can be like greater than this like limit, this 10% depth of the channel. Uh, also, it can stabilize bubbles more easily uh, because the viscosity is higher. So to address this, we made sure to stir the yogurt, uh, stir, 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 to allow and also allow the sample to get warmer so that before like backloading it to the syringe. Um, so for the MVROC2, since we were using that for milk, we used the level generator or also known as easy mode. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this. But this is a really nice mode for shear rate sweeps. It makes these shear rate sweeps uh, a lot easier. Uh, so when you select this mode, the software is gonna run a sweep that corresponds to the widest pressure range of the chip. So you're, util you're, 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 uh, sorry, you're utilizing, excuse me, the maximum extent that this chip can, can, can perform at. So we also set the retrieval mode on the MVROC2. Uh, to retrieve the sample and this is going to allow you to get in theory like unlimited measurements without you having to reload the syringe or to like touch the unit just set it go come back and you, you can see your data so the cleaning of this chip um, and the reservoir on this unit um, so this was an automatic process as well which was performed on the chip cleaning station so much easier to clean um, so for the yogurt measurements, we allowed the sample to equilibrate 10 minutes uh, after priming the chip and after it reached the temperature you wanted. So this cleaning consisted of 1% um, equit and this cleaning uh, relied on the syringe pump of this, uh, of the MBROC1. So yeah, we performed all these methods we just described and then this is the question we have in mind how can we use the VROC to study uh, characterize the these dairy products at multiple shear rates and these uh, relevant temperatures so to continue answering that we went ahead and obtained the following results so viscosity versus shear rate is plotted here this data here is for yogurt this data here is for milk. We can see milk is displaying Newtonian behavior for both temperatures. So the higher temperature would be the higher temperature would give you the lower viscosity here. Lower temperature would give you the higher viscosity. Uh, same thing for yogurt. <clears throat> um, so if let's say you take your glass of milk out of the fridge, it's around five degrees, you let it sit to room temperature, your viscosity is expected to drop in half, as shown here. Uh, even though we didn't measure skim or 2% milk, these are expected to have a lower viscosity because of their lower fat content. So now looking at the yogurt data, it's shear thinning for both samples. <clears throat> so it's viscosity about 10 times greater than milks. It depends on the shear rate as well. 
<clears throat> and this higher viscosity is due to this um, to an aggregation of the casein micelles. It's like a gel structure in this yogurt. So these casein micelles are these huge, um, it's like 100 to 200 micron micelles in the milk uh, uh, that um, they themselves contain other like these things called self micelles and these uh, can these are what are contributing to like the white color that uh, you usually we usually associate with the milk. So this data here is um, from a run that we started with a low rate. We ramped up and then we ramped down and the viscosity actually remained the same on the ramp down. <clears throat> so we were, uh, that was um, interesting to see. Um, so another interesting thing is that when starting the flow of yogurt um, through the chip at this lowest rate, you could see like the viscosity versus time curve, the viscosity transient curve, it would jump up, uh, display a peak, and then drop and plateau. Uh, and this is behavior is kind of consistent with uh, like yield stress fluids, like mayonnaise, like we studied before, and we saw this with mayonnaise. So I think it's important to mention uh, last that this yogurt um, may not be like a good representation. Like this data may not represent the viscosity of all yogurt products. And this is because there's multiple preparation methods, like to make different brands or different types of yogurt, like Greek yogurt, plain yogurt, even like a different, uh, like kefir, for example, that uh, sometimes is considered a yogurt. So yeah, that will vary. Um, so to conclude, uh, here is a quick overview of what we went over today. So we went over our Viroc technology, uh, we used, uh, which is what we use to measure the viscosity of these fruit products. Um, our measurements supported uh, the fact that guar gum can partially degrade under these acidic and high temperature conditions. Um, and we know that the initium and the new Enviroc 2 can be used to study this process. And this, this can take multiple hours, but that's not an issue with these instruments. Um, we also performed the intrinsic viscosity measurements in a concentration uh, series of sodium cassinate, um, sodium cassinate solution. And this is, uh, was done to perform this intrinsic viscosity analysis to calculate the hydrodynamic, hydrodynamic radius and volume fraction. In the last section, we investigated uh, emulsions. Uh, we performed uh, shear and extensional measurements on different types of mayo and uh, as well as dairy products like milk and yogurt. And here we showcase the use of our newly released Ambiroc 2. And these results and analysis that you know we show in this talk is they can hopefully, and I think they can help with formulating uh, new product varieties in the future. That are going to give you like a better texture, like mouthfeel, um, and of course with helping with other things like optimizing the, the food processing of these things, um, their packaging as well. So yeah, with that, I would like to thank you for attending the webinar, and I will now is a good time for to take any questions, um, and if. I'm not too familiar with some questions. I can let my um, colleague here, Marina, answer those. So let's go on to the question tab. Um, there you go. So I'm trying, I'm trying to open these questions here. We do have a question. So it seems to be hidden a bit. Oh, I found it. It looks like the question is, what is the largest solid particle size in liquid this can handle? So the largest solid particle size? Oh, there's oh, more there's questions. More. Oh, we'll answer that one first and go back to the other one. So the largest solid particle size in liquid would be 10% the depth of the channel. So let's say the highest, the th um, largest de depth chips we have are 300 microns in depth um, so these for these the largest particles in your liquid solution would um, 
can be up to uh, 30 microns. So anything smaller than 30 microns, and you can measure these. All right, let's see here. Maybe. Oh, it looks like there's quite a few. All right. Um, mm -hmm. What drives flow in the V-Rock if it's not gravity? So instead of gravity-driven flow, uh, here we have a flow driven by a this um, linear um, actuator. So it's a, a pump that is um, pushing the sample through your test syringe. Um, so it's pushing this piston that pushes your sample through the chip at your precise uh, shear rate uh, that you want to measure at. Uh, so we this is, is not uh, affected by um, would not be affected by the like, gravity effects. Okay. Uh, the next question we have here is, what was the cut off of the filter? Cut off of the filter. So not, so, but what I understand from this question is the, that what is the uh, pore size of the filter? So for for our samples of guar gum, we used um, five micron pore size filter. For our samples with um, sodium cassinate, we dropped the pore size to 0.1 microns. 0.1 microns. Um, and this um, was not expected to affect uh, any of the of the sodium castanate micelles in solution. Okay. Let's see. Is there a way you can? Uh... Reading from a very small. Oh, screen. I can see now here. Okay, we're gonna so, make it bigger. One sec. There we go. Perfect. Okay, you can. Okay, okay. So we were on. This. Uh huh. How would such a pH slash temperature profile testing look with enzymes? So we've worked with um, with enzymes before. So we looked at enzymes that degraded um, this biodegradable polymer. So in our case, it was polycaprolactone. And we published an app note that was released uh, earlier this year. So the enzymes were lipase from candida and um, I'd have to check what the other enzyme would, was. Um, so for that one, we um, we would heat up the samples uh, before uh, introducing them into the initial into the instruments. So we would uh, heat those up in a um, in a hot plate. Um, we would use uh, <clears throat> we would introduce the the enzyme into a liquid solution, uh, aqueous solution with the uh, polycaprolactone. And then we would remove that solution, uh, dissolve the polycaprolactone and compare the, like the con control with no uh, added uh, enzyme to the solutions, uh, the, to the polycaprolactone that had the added, added uh, enzyme. And you could see that the viscosity was uh, lower for that um, um, likely degraded uh, polymer sample. Um, but yeah, you can uh, formulate these measurements um, if you, like similar to the one shown in this talk. So you can introduce your, introduce your enzyme, your degrading enzyme into your sample, provided that it can, uh, dissolves well. Um, and then quickly introduce that into the unit and then perform these measurements over multiple hours, and you uh, can be um, able to see how this viscosity will drop uh, over this uh, length of time. And if you want to uh, perform such measurements, we can help you, uh, you can contact us, we can help you with making this uh, the more optimized uh, measurement protocol. All right. Uh, if you load the same yogurt sample and repeat the shear rate experiment, how similar would the curves be? So if you load the same yogurt sample and repeat the shear uh, rate experiments, we actually got similar um, 
So similar um, profiles, like the viscosity uh, versus shear rate was uh, similar from, uh, from one uh, sample to the next. But here I am not sure if you're referring to the same sample that was sheared. So if it was if it was the same sample that was um, sheared, uh, we didn't try that. We did try loading like the same sample, um, but like a new uh, like new uh, um, sample from the container from the um, container that we got from the store, and that one displayed the same viscosity versus shear rate. But if we tried using the same sample we collected after running it to the unit, that we haven't uh, tried yet. Are there any other questions here? I believe we are at the last okay. of our questions. Okay, so I can read. Uh, oh, there's an. So there's a couple more questions. So, um, so the question here is: the software capable of doing any of the calculations you discussed, or does it have to be done outside the software? So, these intrinsic viscosity calculations can be done with uh, this Clarity software that we released. So, um, you can get a free trial access to this software. And there you would um, pretty much uh, export your data from the initial unit, uh, download it in the software, and this will allow you to uh, quickly uh, calculate the intrinsic viscosity from uh, your data. Um, and then, of course, you have the option too of um, calculating it separately, you know, by making your own uh, uh, data analysis in an Excel file uh, as well. I believe we're at the end of our questions. We'll wait one more minute in case anyone has any lingering questions. So there's one question here. It shows how, when I run a sample, the graph like plateaus, how could I solve it? So I don't know if you are referring to the viscosity versus time graph. Or um, so if you are referring to that one, this one is expected uh, to plateau. Um, so for each segment, you will have the viscosity measured versus time. Um, and we are the viscosity we take from each segment is the average of the viscosities we take from that plateau. Um, now, if you're referring to those long-term experiments we took, where we took the viscosity over multiple hours for hundreds of segments, um, for those, um, did we see any plateau for those? So we saw somewhat of a plateau. How can I go back here? So I don't think we quite got to that plateau, like where the viscosity wasn't changing as much anymore. And that's, you know, meaning that the sample wasn't degrading as much anymore. Uh, so here we go. As you can see, we didn't exactly get to the plateaus uh, for those, but that would be something we can try later on to run these for, you know, even more hours and check uh, like how long it takes to plateau, uh, what's the value of the viscosity of the plateau. So that's a good thing to try later on. Um, it looks like Look. we are officially done with the questions. We have not received any other ones. So I think we'll come to an end with our webinar. Um, thank you everyone who attended. I uh, hope you got some valuable information out of it. And thank you, Dr. Ochoa, for your lovely presentation for the day. Um, I hope you all have a very lovely rest of your day and rest of your week. And happy holidays since it's Memorial Day weekend next weekend. Thank you, Marina. Thank you, guys. Have a good uh, Memorial Day weekend.